The numbers, Mason. What do they mean? Where are they brought from? I don't know from? anything about any numbers. We want the numbers, Mason. That's all we've ever wanted. God! I just keep hearing the fucking numbers! Completing Fez is like unraveling a great, convoluted conspiracy theory only to find out that no one was conspiring to do anything. Because once you make it past all the sordid internet drama and the cutesy retro platformer facade and the actual superficiality of Fez's defining mechanic and the credits roll of the game itself, there is an end game. And once you make it past a few more easy platform challenges that you might have missed the first time, you'll find a meaty core to the game that's unique and very worth talking about. Except, no one's doing that. I know that a lot of people out there haven't played this game out of principle and will specifically go out of their way to make sure they never do, so I don't really feel bad for spoiling the experience if you're never going to play it, so instead I can use this video as an opportunity to inform people of what they're missing. Specifically, they're missing puzzles. Lots and lots of puzzles. They're unique and worth talking about, because when you're going for 100% completion of Fez, then you're in for an uphill battle against puzzles so dense and complex that they might actually get you to rethink how games can handle puzzles at all. Puzzles are a careful balancing act between many different kinds of problem-solving strategies that can pretty easily be categorized within two different schools of thought. On one hand, you have puzzles that require more abstraction. They require you to drum up solutions in your head and then apply them to the system. On the other hand, there are puzzles that follow more strict mathematical rules and limitations and require more methodological solutions. You go through these two different kinds of thinking when solving a lot of problems in your day-to-day -day life. But for the sake of a video game show, let me give you a few classic examples. Sliding block puzzles are a good example of challenges that rarely try to stress the logic of the system the player is working in. The limits and rules of the puzzle are clearly visible, and so is the solution. The process of getting there is the hard part, and it usually requires a bit of trial and error to figure out just how and where these blocks need to move. On the other hand, lateral thinking puzzles have you thinking creatively for unexpected solutions rather than following the man's rules. For example, walking backwards outside of a room in antechamber to access another room is a process that doesn't follow any logic of how three-dimensional geometry should work. You have to think outside the box to come to that conclusion. I'd also argue that a lot of the old-school adventure game stumpers fall into this category too. But the lines between these two blur, and they should. Oftentimes, a good balance between using your left and right brains is what it takes to make for a compelling puzzle adventure. And that's where Fez comes back in. The puzzles in the later game are just so lateral. They require you to think outside the box and play the game as a physical object outside of its own fictional world. I mentioned the QR codes in an earlier video, but the later puzzles take it so much further than that. They're tuning forks that make either the left or right half of your controller vibrate, so what you do is input a code based on when and where the controller shakes. There's another code hidden in plain sight within the achievements list, and there's also this clock that spawns collectibles in the game at only certain hours, days, minutes, and weeks of real life. These puzzles make you interact with the game not as an immersive piece of fiction, but rather as a mundane piece of software installed on some kind of hardware. And in the case of that clock puzzle, it actually gets you to play with the console or the PC itself. I'm pretty sure that what you're supposed to do is jump in and out of the game over the course of several days and watch this clock count down to zero, but come on, just change the settings. Anyways, that doesn't even scratch the surface of the more logical, deductive stuff. So these are all the notes and papers and stuff that it took to complete the game. I made little paper craft cubes. So in here in Sharpie is the game's language and in pencil is the Roman alphabet. So you rotate it to find the Fez symbol you need to translate and then you have the alphabetical character you need. So I guess I just got Fez all over my desk. Decoding the alphabet is easy, but you gotta recognize a clue that just comes straight out of left field. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Once you know that, you draw up a key and realize that the weird language you see everywhere isn't actually a new language at all. It's English, but the symbols are just different. The symbols themselves can all be represented on this cube by rotating each of its six sides four times each, which makes 24 different symbols. It's not perfect. Two characters have to share symbols with others, but you won't be misinterpreting any messages because of that. On the other hand, the number system had me stumped for days. There's a classroom that's supposed to show you how it works, but I never figured that out. 
Instead, I use these four treasure maps, which are each marked with a number, and so I decided to just solve it by trial and error. I brute forced a solution by trying every possible combination, and since there were only 24 possible solutions, then it wasn't an impossible endeavor. It took time, but eventually I found out what numbers 1 through 4 were, but that still didn't crack the boiler room in the beginning of the game, which is a code made out of eight numbers. And the problem I was having there was that there are actually two ways that this language represents the number three. As it turns out, this numbering scheme uses the addition and subtraction of typographical elements to depict the sum of what each numerical character represents as a symbol. To me, it looked like a totally alien way of representing numbers. Unlike the alphabet, it actually felt like another language. You need to know these languages to collect the 32 cubes and the 32 anti-cubes that are required to get the alternate ending, but totally completing Fez requires you to take an even further step into reality-shattering obscurity. One collectible in particular requires you to translate blinking red stars into binary, and then break that binary down into 8 bits, and then translate that binary into hexadecimal, and then to ASCII to get the code. But the shiniest collectible of them all is hidden behind this scary black monolith. You have to translate this tome into pure nonsense gibberish, and then read that gibberish three-dimensionally, with the first letter of every page preceding the first letter of the next page. You then put those pages together and use the page numbering of that tome to rearrange the order of the numbers in the game's release date. You translate that number into Fez's language, stack it up into a three-dimensional object, and then cast a shadow on it to get your code. And what's funny is that no one actually needed to figure that out. The community all got together and brute forced a valid solution and put some monotonous hours of work to logically come up with the code. Meanwhile, other people were laterally dreaming up another way to get to it, one that involved the elaborate relationship between all these cryptic clues. But those clues are there, and they were there all along. That might have been how the community was supposed to do it, but now that we're looking at it from a retrospective point of view, then almost any solution that any fan dreams up is gonna look like a valid way of solving this massive puzzle. This game breaks out of the fourth wall so hard that it actually lands on top of your desk. The end game of Fez provides a unique perspective on all the different kinds of thinking that it takes to solve puzzles. It has you sliding blocks one minute and decrypting codes the next. And if you really get into it, then you'll be converting game codes out of programming languages, or constructing in-game objects outside of the game. These puzzles aren't exactly fun to solve, and they're not there for the sake of elegant design. They're a completionist's challenge. A lot of them require time and work, and not much else. The only reward is the satisfying feeling of overcoming a huge challenge. The fact that they're there is a psychological tease that begs you to try and crack them, and the journey towards completing it will actually see the game leak out of the screen and spill all over reality. You might start to question where the game begins and ends, and what part of your space it occupies. Fez looks like an old-school platformer, but it's actually a radically unique and modern puzzle game. It's an homage to the adventure games of the 80s that had impossible secrets meant to block your progress without a strategy guide. But the big difference here is that making the strategy guide yourself is part of playing the game. So that's what makes it unique and worth talking about. And I think it's important that people know about the well-intentioned ideas this game had that contributed to the medium as a whole. This thing does interesting things with puzzles that no other game does. So in case you haven't or won't play it, then there you go. That's what you missed.